Good morning, everybody. Uh, Fergus Dolan here from NALA. You're very welcome to our numeracy webinar during Maths Week on analyzing errors and misconceptions in mathematics. And uh, we're delighted to have uh, Mark Prendergast this morning. Mark is a senior lecturer in education at University College Cork, and Mark is going to be facilitating for you. So over to you, Mark, and all the best. Hi, Fergus. Thanks a million um, for, for the invite for facilitating this webinar. Delighted to be here today and I hope everyone is keeping well and you have been enjoying all the activities during the week for Maths Week. Um, today, we're going to focus on analysing errors and misconceptions in maths. Um, so this is a kind of a, an area that I've kind of grown in interest over the last number of years. And I think, you know, for, for everyone teaching maths, it's, it's important just to be able to, you know, analyse the errors and misconceptions that might frequently occur and see how we can target them most effectively. So just to get everyone thinking, I'm going to start off with it with a warm up question. Um, I want you to write down the value of 10 minus eight divided by two plus nine. So you can just do it um, on your own. I'm not going to call on anyone. Don't worry uh, this early in, in the webinar, um, but I'll just give you a few moments to, to complete that. Okay, so again, I, I won't call on anyone, but the answer is 15. Um, now, you know, often when I, when I, when I do this question with um, any, any group, really, even with, with, our, with our own pre-service teachers, there, there's, there might be a variety of answers. Some might, some might have made a, a slip or a mistake along the way and got an answer of eight or 12 or so on, but a very common misconception might be an answer of 10. Okay, so uh, this is obviously an order of operations question where you had to do the division first. Um, if you if you work from left to right, you would have got 15. If you if you made the common misconception of forgetting the order of operations, you would have got 10. So it's just it's a nice question to kind of start off. Um, I suppose it highlights the difference between a mistake and a misconception. Like what we'd say is anybody can make a mistake in maths. They tend to be very much one off events and the result of, of a carelessness or a slip. But misconceptions are they're systematic errors. Uh, if I give if I give a, a similar question again and you 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 made you made the, the misconception and you got 10, it's very likely that you make the same misconception in the next question in, in terms of the order of operations. So mistakes are one off slips, misconceptions are more systematic. And it's likely that the same error will be made again and again and again. And most misconceptions comes from kind of pupils or students overgeneralizing a result from when they learned mathematics previously or misinterpreting rules that they've learned that, or that they've been taught in the past. So again, just some, some examples. Uh, I'm just going to get you to, to think about them really independently and, and I'll talk through them. So we have 93 minus 47 and the student here has got a, given an answer of 54. So is this a mistake or a misconception? And I suppose looking at a one-off uh, question like that, it's often very hard to kind of see is it a mistake or a misconception or what, what the student has actually done. So that's why you, sometimes you have to analyze a couple of pieces of the student's work to really try and get to grips with, okay, is there a pattern here? What misconception have they made? Okay, and hopefully some of you have, have, have seen that. In this case, the student is, um, if, you, if you take the first example there, they subtracted the seven from the, or the three from the seven, they've got four, and then they subtracted the four from the nine, they got, they've got five. In the second example, um, they've subtracted the four from the six to get two, and then the two from the four to get two. So the, the, I suppose the, the, the rule that, they miss, that the, this misconception is based on from, from their previous learning might have been something like you often hear being taught, take the smaller number from the larger number. So they've misinterpreted that rule and they're doing it all the time. Um, so you can see that misconception very clearly. Another example here, 0 0.2 multiplied by 10 
and the student is given 0 0.20. So is that a mistake or a misconception? Again, from a one-off, it's very hard to see. But if we look at other examples of the student's work, you know, when, they, when they're asked to multiply 1.5 by 10, they get 1.50, 2.4, 5.4 by 10, they're getting 2.540. So the, the rule that they've misinterpreted there from their previous learning is, again, it's another one, another common, common statement you often hear being taught. When you multiply a number by 10, you just add a zero to the end of that number. But that's not always true, as you can see here. So we need to be very careful with the rules that we teach with the, with the kind of the wide statements that we make that this sometimes can be misinterpreted by students and overgeneralized, um, which lead to these misconceptions. Another example here, which we'd come across in second level, um, in, in lower second level and indeed upper second level all the time, you know, something like 3x equals 12, so x equals 4. Um, so is that a mistake or a misconception? Hard to see from that maybe, but if we look at other, another example of the student's work, 2x equals 14, so x equals minus 7. So the student, they, they know they're trying to isolate the x. In the first example, they're dividing across both sides by the 3. But again, they're overgeneralizing a rule. When a number crosses the equal sign, it changes sign. Um, so in this case, that's where the misconception has arisen. So um, these are some other common examples of kind of um, rules that lead to misconceptions. Again, I'm sure you've come across them yourselves. Addition and multiplication makes, make, makes numbers bigger. Is that always the case? Subtraction and division make numbers smaller. Fractions, the amount of times, uh, you know, I've see, uh, students see two fractions, whether it's, be, you know, even if they're being added, it's just like, okay, what do I do? Top by top, bottom by bottom. That's, what they're, that's what's ingrained in their, in their minds. Uh, the equal sign. So an awful lot of misconceptions occur around the equal sign because students are just so used to the equal sign meaning find the answer or write the answer. So there, were, there was a nice paper by, by Ashlock um, and they, they show this example to students. So um, an unknown, so a box equals seven plus eight. So what, what's that equal? And the student said, you, actually, you can't do that. You can't write a question like that. That's, you know, that's, you, can, you can't solve that and um, because they're so ingrained if you look at any textbook the, the vast majority of questions are um, you know the, the two terms are being added or subtracted or multiplied or divided then there's an equal sign and they're trying to find out what it is so just for a couple of moments and, and I would like you to try and get involved here and share some of your own examples from your own teaching experiences are there any common examples of students misconceptions that you've come across so I know from my own experience, you know, there's the common ones that you know are going to crop up every year when you're teaching a topic. So um, can you come up with some common examples that you have come across? Why do you think the misconception occurred and, and how would you explain the misconception to your student? So even if you can just have a few, a few moments to think and even share the examples of the misconception and you can consider them in your own time, why do you think it occurred? So I'm just going to give a couple of moments and then if people want to unmute themselves or even um, write into the chat, we, we can discuss from there. Okay, so anyone brave enough to share? Any common misconceptions that you come across in your own practice? Uh, lovely, we have a couple in the in the chat. Thank you, Siobhan. Multiplying decimals and dividing decimals. Uh, I use the abbreviation of move the decimal point to the left or to the right. Yeah. So yeah, and how do you how do you find that works, Siobhan? Do you wanna? Hi, sorry, I'll unmute myself. Thanks, I Lord. find it very good. Um, I, what I'd write down is we'll say um, 0.2, and I want to multiply that. So I just say use the abbreviation MR, multiply, move your decimal point to the right, and I'll physically uh, take the decimal point with an, an alternate spiral and just show it 
by moving it over and then uh, putting the decimal point in on the right hand side. When they can see the visual thing, uh, moving to the right is one thing and then to visually see um, a drawing of taking it and moving it to the right, then they, they seem to understand it better. And I'd use the opposite then for um, uh, division. Yeah, I think the visual there is really important, Siobhan. That's that's excellent. So, um, yeah, that, and uh, it's great just to have something like that that you can refer to when you're teaching. Because I think place value and decimals in particular, there, it's definitely an area where there's always misconceptions and kind of common errors. Yeah, I learned it in primary school and I won't say how many years ago. It stayed with me. <laughs> Thanks, Siobhan. Um, Felix. Um, so in terms of college students having consistent problems when dividing powers. So uh, two to the power. So two to the power of A divided by two to the power of B. Yeah, so I, I think that's a that's a huge, a, a huge thing, Felix. Um, so working with indices. Um, so yeah, there, there's an awful lot of issues work, when working with indices. And I suppose that even comes back to and I, I wouldn't say that that's even a college issue. Like it, obviously we see the current in college all the time, but it stems from earlier in their maths education where they're just learning off. You know, I remember myself learning off the seven or eight different rules of, of indices, but it's very hard. You know, we were never taught where these rules came from. So why, when you're multiplying or subtract or dividing numbers of the same base, you add or subtract indices. And, it's, you know, if you actually see, as Siobhan said, a visual, a visual layer of why it's happening it's it's you, you conceptually understand it and you remember it and um but when you're just learning off rules that's when you misinterpret rules and you get mixed up with rules uh, and it's often the case that i i know every year the imta um look at uh past leaving cert papers and and they go through the solutions and you, you take the most complex leaving cert um work like the, the the mistakes that are being made by students are all basic algebra, you know, mistakes, even in the most difficult calculus question, they can do the, the differentiation, but it's when they actually have to tidy it up or, you know, add addition or subtraction of like terms, that's where the errors and the mistakes come. So, you know, even multiplying algebraic fractions, it's the basic method for how do I multiply fractions is that's where, you know, that's where the mistakes come in. So um, I think those those basics that we have in our early childhood kind of stay with stay with us. Um, so thanks, Felix, for for sharing that. Um, so great to see some engagement there. Thank you to everyone. Um, we we'll just uh, move on slightly, and and again, I'll have kind of different things to for for everyone to get involved in. Um, so basically, in our, in order to target misconceptions, um, we really need to analyze students' work to try and diagnose and address any misconceptions. So in order to do that, we, we try and look for error patterns so we can identify the difficulties that students are having. So again, I'm just giving an example here, and um, I'd love for anyone to pop in and unmute and, and see, can they figure out what the student has done here? So they're adding 25 and 37, and they're getting 53. So as I noted earlier, it's, it's often very hard to see from one example. So here are two other examples of the student doing the same type of task. So can anyone see in the first one how the student gets 53? The second example, how, how the student gets 67? Can anyone? Would anyone like to come in either in the chat or, or on mute? Um, instead of carrying the one they're just adding us, are they, to the units? Linda, sorry, we, we missed. Th thanks a million for, for popping in. Um, what did you, what did, we missed the start of. Oh, sorry, I was just saying they're adding, instead of carrying the one, they're adding it to the units. Yeah, target. excellent. Well done, Linda, for, and, and well done on the spot. And that. So for that example, the first one, um, you know, they're adding the seven and the five and they're getting 12. Um, do you know what they're probably they're probably starting even from left to right they're probably saying the two plus the three gives a five then five and seven gives me 12 um so then you know in terms of the 12 they're adding the one and the two to get the three yeah and the second one there they're saying four plus two gives me six eight and eight gives me 16 so one plus six gives me the seven yeah so you can see exactly what's happening there so that that's a, like an error that's happening that the student will keep making unless it's, it's targeted by the, by the teacher. 
So I can see someone come in the chat there. Um, they're carrying, yeah, thanks for that, Felix. And um, just another example again. So what's happening here, we, we've multiplication of two terms, 43 multiplied by six, and the student is getting 308. So again, from one example, it's hard. So here are two other examples. 35 by 5, they're getting 255. 63 by 7, they're getting 561. They're, they're adding the carry um, to the tens column and then they're multiplying it out. So in the first example, let's say 63 is 18, and then they add the 4 and 1 to get 5, giving you 6. Five is equals 30. Excellent. Yeah. Well done, Mary. Thank, thanks for seeing that. Exactly. That's what they're doing. Um, okay. So uh, I was even um, I was even interpreting that even a, a slightly different way, but it's the exact same thing where I was saying, okay, are they are they looking at six by three is eighteen? They're carrying the one, which which is great, but they're interpreting that one uh, as uh, as a full six. So they're saying six by three is twenty four, and adding the six then. Um, but I think it's, it's the exact same thing as you said, just, just interpreted slightly different. So you can see um, how issues like that, you know, even in those three examples, they need to be addressed by the students. A really nice way of being able to kind of target misconceptions and look for different errors is using diagnostic testing. I'm not sure was anyone um, at the, the Irish Maths Teachers Association conference last year where they had um, a really excellent guest speaker uh, called Mr. He has a number of maths books out. It's called Mr. Barton Maths. Um, so he's a UK maths teacher, but he has a website, and I've I've put the website uh, on the slide there, where he set up a, a full bank of diagnostic questions on a series of different topics um, for 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 maths. So he uses these diagnostic tests. Then when he's when he's introducing our our sorry, when he's revising a topic with his students, he gives them a diagnostic test so he can try and then um, diagnose where the issues or misunderstandings are. So, you know, there's, you, you can make up your own <coughs> diagnostic questions or there's a full bank of ready-made quizzes and questions there that you can choose from uh, and make a quiz for your own students. So an example of a, of a ready-made question is here, which number is the biggest? So there's five numbers, or sorry, four numbers, and all involving decimal points. So a really nice thing I like about the website is that it actually shows you, um, you know, the responses of students who've done that question already. Um, so like in this case, there was a couple of thousand students who would have done this question, and, and it, it records their results. And you can see that. 79% um, of students got the right answer. They, they chose uh, D, which was 0 0.51 uh, as being the biggest number. Um, but what I even like further is it gives the number of students who chose the other, the other three examples, A, B, or C in this case. And, and even more so, you can go into examples A, B, and C, um, and it, it asks students to explain their reasoning. So I really like that because you can see exactly what the student was thinking you know, for example, this student picked out example, um, picked out option A as being the biggest number, 0 0.503. And like looking at it, you might say, how did they pick that? But you can see their reasoning actually makes sense. You can see I chose A because there's hundreds, tenths and units, and they are bigger than the other. So if I remove the zero before the decimal point, it'd be 503. So you can see that they have a very clear reasoning why they chose option A. So as a teacher then, you know how you'd how you'd go to address that the next time the next time you meet the student. Another example there is which of these is a factor of 27? So this is another question from the website. So which of these is a factor of 27? So again, I, I, I just found it really useful that you could go um, and interpreted the results that have already been recorded. And you can see that 60% of, of students uh, or of people who have done that question got it right. But 20% also picked um, example or option B or option C. And you can go into, you can look at that even further and look at what were the reasons for, P, for um, students picking option B or C. And a kind of a common example why 
student picked example or option B was because 13.5 goes into 27 two times. So again, there's some misunderstanding there of what a factor actually is. And then they were picking option C because 27 by two gives me 54. So you can see there the reasoning behind their thinking. Um, this was another example, work out minus seven, minus minus 10. Um, you can see that 64% of students uh, uh, opted for option C there, which was three. Um, however, you know, there was 17% looked at option A, 12% um, of B and so on. So uh, I looked at why students might have been picking um, option A and they said, one, one student noted, the answer is A because if you do minus seven, minus minus 10, you're going backwards. So they're thinking of the number line. If you do minus seven and then minus minus 10, you're going backwards. So the answer is minus 17. So you can see they're kind of line of thought there. And from that, you, you kind of know what you need to do to try and address that. And the last one of these that I just want to show you is um, they had to work out one fifth multiplied by one fifth. And if you look at the various options here, you can see the 70% got the right answer and they, they went for option A. But again, you know, 10% opted for B, 12% for C. So um, if you look at those who, who said C, this is one example. I said C because one times one is two and five times five is 25. Um, so it's two over 25. So I'm wondering, was that just a, a kind of a mistake when they were multiplying one by one? Or is it a misconception around the multiplication there? Uh, option B is maybe a little bit more worrying in terms of they, they're saying they multiplied one by one. Uh, or sorry, option D, they multiplied one by one, which equal two, and then five by five, which gives me 10. So they're obviously, there's a bigger issue there in terms of when they're multiplying, they're just adding the numbers. So definitely, um, if you do have some kind of spare time, like that's, I, I've just been messing around with the website. It's a free website. You can, you need to register as a teacher and you can just log in. And as I said, he has a, a huge bank of diagnostic questions there on a huge range of topics that you can filter down and um, you can use for your own, for your own class, class groups. Uh, like, as I said, that's just one aspect of the website. He has lots of other resources there that are really useful for, for teaching maths. He actually published a book in the last kind of two years. It's called um, How I Wish I Taught Mathematics. And again, it's, it's a book I, I'd recommend. Um, you get some really useful insights into it. So in terms of targeting the misconceptions, uh, a study carried out by Cox showed that students have been shown to continue to apply the same patterns even one year later, unless they've been addressed by their teacher. So unless we target these misconceptions, students will continue to make them. And again, another study by Ricomi noted that you can't just simply tell students that they were wrong or look, tell them, look, this is what you've done, and then say, go off and practice another 10 examples. That's typically not effective. There has to be kind of a target, you know, a really specific target of the misunderstanding or the, the steps. Um, like there's no need to reteach the whole entire skill or concept. You just really need to get down into the nitty gritty of, of what they've done wrong and try and target that. So an example that I just tried to um, come up with there what might be the addition of these fractions. Um, one third plus a half. So again, students are probably getting mixed up with that misconception of, uh, okay, I've seen two fractions, top by top, bottom by bottom, and they're just, that's, they're just simply adding. And um, so, uh, you know, one way to maybe target that would be, OK, you're, you're, the, the solution you're given is two eighths. We, we can simplify that down to one quarter. Now, think of think visualize this um, like you're, you're given an answer of one quarter when you've added a third plus a fifth. You know, before you even add on the fifth, a third is already bigger, to, bigger than a quarter. So if you're adding on something that, to that third, it's certainly going to be bigger than a quarter. So just really getting into that target that misconception and say, okay, so you can see now that, that that answer doesn't make sense. So what do we need to do to try and address it? Another way to, to anticipate misconception, another way to target them is to try and anticipate the misconceptions. And uh, there was a nice kind of paper written by Lemov in 2015, where he noted to plan for error. And some possible approaches to do that is, you know, we, we all teach the same topics year on year. So and we, we see the same misconceptions coming up. So um, you know, in, the one approach might be to warn pupils of the likely misconceptions, explain why they're incorrect, and then demonstrate the correct methods. 
Or another method, kind of the flip of that, is to allow the misconceptions to occur and use those as teaching points. Um, and, and I'll give some examples of that later on. Um, there was a really excellent uh, maths educator in the UK called Malcolm Swan. I'm not sure if some of you come across him. He actually passed away in, in the, the last few years, but he, again, has an excellent, excellent bank of numeracy maths resources. So Malcolm Swan, if you just Google um, Swan and maths resources, you come up with, you, you, you get directed to the website. But he actually recommended posing questions that can create conflict where students might disagree and then using that kind of to create discussion and debate and generate understanding from there. So a, a nice question for, for that might be continue the sequence 4.1, 4.3, 4.5, 4.7. 4 so if you just gave that to your students, you know, some students will say, okay, um, the next the next term there might be 4.9, the next term might be 4.11. 4.11, 4.13, whereas other students might say, okay, no, uh, the, the next term would be 4.9, but then I go 5.1, 5.3. So it, it will generate a bit of a little bit of discussion, a bit of debate in the class. And it's a it's a nice kind of um, angle for you to come in and, and and use that as a teaching, as a teaching point. Um, the other example I just show you here was the very first example we used today on the webinar, um, where in that order of operations, where students will you know, some will get an answer of 10, others will get an answer of 15, and both will be convinced that they're correct because in their minds, they've done everything right mathematically, but they just haven't applied the order of operations in that case. So it's a, you know, when I, where I, I often use that question when I'm introducing the order of operations before I've told anything to students about what the order of operations are, because it's a really nice um, kind of starting point that, okay, we've got, we've got two answers. We've got the answer of 15, we've got the answer of 10, None of us believe we've done anything right or wrong mathematically, but we can't have two answers to the same question. So we need an order of operations here. And that's the rationale for it. So just uh, backing up on the last point, one of the, one of the approaches was to use misconceptions as teaching point. And there's some, there's some nice uh, resources for doing this on the, the test website, www.tes.com, um, where they have basically some, mis some common misconceptions and they've tasks around that. So an, an example of one is here, find the median of these test marks out of zero. So you can see Clive's answer, he's got an answer of seven. There's then a space for you to give your answer and what mistake has Cl Clive made. So it's, I think students really like seeing what someone else has done and seeing, okay, what, what's the actual mistake that they've made and how can I, how can I do something differently? So in this case, you can see that, you know, Clive has done everything right in calculating the median um, in terms of it being the middle value, but he hasn't arranged the numbers in order before he's done that. So it's just a small mistake. But again, if that's not addressed, he'll keep doing that over and over again. Another using a misconception as a teaching point, a, a group of children in another school were asked to calculate the area of the shape below. So, so here's the area of the, here's the shape they're given. And, um, you know, uh, you might come up with these questions then. Jane said that the answer was 120 meters squared. Can you explain how she got this answer? Is, is she correct? Bill said the answer was 44 meters. Can you explain how he got the answer? Is she correct? Is he correct? Sorry, that should be. And Aoife said the answer was 100 meters squared. Can you explain how Aoife got this answer? Is she correct? So again, I might just give you a moment um, to have a look at that task and try and see what Jane, Bill and Aoife have done in order to get their answers. Okay, does anyone want to pop in there and any, what has, what has Jane done to get an answer of 120? Can anyone see that? She has really just calculated the area of the bigger rectangle and hasn't remembered to take out the, um, 
area to the left. Yeah, excellent, Mary. Uh, and again, that probably just goes uh, in terms of Jane is, has said, okay, how do I find area again? Area is length by, length by weight. So she just look for the length, look for the weight and, and multiply the two of those. Yeah. Um, thanks for that, Mary. And thanks for that, Siobhan, in the chat. Uh, Bill, Bill said the answer was 44. Any idea where Bill might have got that answer? Anyone want to come in there on that? Bill said the answer was 44 meters. How did he come up with 44? So when, what, when we're five by um, multiplied um, eight meters by five meters um, and then add the, um, the missing space, like four meters by one. So it's like five by eight forty, and then yeah. add the missing bit um, yeah. in. So kind of um, yeah. No thanks for that. All right. Just just um, maybe it derives from misreading. Um, yeah, misreading uh, this four meters uh, by one. Yeah, a, a couple of um, um, misinterpretations of the figures and the way of calculating area. Yeah. So obviously five by eight and then added this four meters by one somehow. Yeah, that, that certainly might be something that they did do because again, uh, looking from what Jane had done. Um, another thing that Bill may have done is, uh, you know, when we're, when we're, when we teach area, we usually teach perimeter before or, or after it um, very yeah, closely. And I, I think he, he might have also added all the values around it and obviously yeah. he need, there's yeah. a missing value so that's another way he possibly could have come up with that 44 but laura what you said there he well could have done as well especially if they're just they're multiplying the values so um and then Aoife, i think uh Aoife has the the correct answer in terms of 100 um so look uh, again i think that's a, a task like that is a really nice task as a maybe a kind of a revision exercise after you've taught area and perimeter and just given uh given that to try you know rather than just saying here are four or five different shapes now i want you to calculate the area and perimeter where it's literally just repetitive practice work giving students something like this where they actually have to try and reason and see and interpret other people's answers i think really helps with understanding uh, so just uh, However, that would be an, an incorrect perimeter. Is that am I right? Uh, no, I think there's just a there's a there's that line there is miss. Sorry, I know. Can you see there? There's a yeah, missing. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, there's exactly. one missing um, figure. So um, they the five they're they're missing a the five. So when you add in the five forty four, be correct. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Th thanks, Laura. Uh, the other just other examples of using misconceptions as teaching points. One one thing I always try and promote usually in my teaching um, is using kind of higher order questions which really get students thinking and I'd often instead of given as I already kind of noted instead of giving the same five questions for homework where students are just repeating um, you know a set of exercises really I'd give one question like this where um, students have to really think about it so a homework question might be how would you reason with your friend who believes that a third is a half so how would you actually go about maybe doing some peer teaching there or explain to the students or explain to your friend um, uh, that, that they might be thinking uh, along the wrong lines there. John says that 0 0.16 is more than 0 0.4 because 16 is greater than four. How would you respond to John? So again, a really nice task there and you know issues it with place value and, and decimals. Emma did the following in last night's homework. Five nines plus two nines equals seven eighteenths. Can you explain how Emma got this answer? Is she correct? Um, this is a, a again another kind of issue with the with the equal sign. Consider the equation nine plus three equals something plus four. 
Charlie is convinced that the missing number is 12. How, you, how might you convince him otherwise? So um, again, I, I'd, I'd always think this is a great way of really getting students to think about what, what, what the error is, how might, how might they actually try and teach or try and explain to someone else um, the reason um, or the, the reasoning behind it. So other misconceptions as teaching points were just this is an example of algebra. Highlight and explain the mistake in each of the following. Um, 4p minus p equals 4. Uh, 3m by m equals 4m. 12q by q equals 24q. 6a plus 4b equals 10ab. 7k squared plus 2k equals 9k squared. So there are very common mistakes that, again, no matter what level you're teaching, you'll come across those when you're in algebra all the time in terms of adding and subtracting like terms, multiplication. Uh, I know Felix even mentioned there, multiplying indices earlier on. Um, there are you know, really common mistakes that crop up again and again and again. So another just um, way in order to try and target misconceptions is really try and encourage students to get into the habit of estimating and predicting their answers and trying to see that it makes sense. So for example here, if students have to add 87 plus 49 and the student gives an answer of 1,216, you know, the, the first thing there is you're, you're actually trying to get students to, okay, what, what answer, when you add 87 plus 49, um, you, you know, what, what answer are you kind of estimating to get there? So you're kind of adding 90 plus 50. So you're roughly getting, you know, in around 150, 140, 130. But if you're getting 1,216, there is a misconception or an error there. You've made some mistake. So trying to get them to go back then and see what they've done. Just, I suppose, on that before we move on, um, again, you can see, can I, if hopefully people can see the error pattern there, what they've done, like that, that 1,216 isn't just coming from, from nowhere. The student has added the eight and the, and the four to get 12. And they've wrote that down. Then they've added the nine and the seven to get 16. So that's where they've got the 1,216. Uh, I always like this example. Um, it's, a, it's a famous example that was used in a, in a big study in the US where, you know, the, the main kind of reasoning around is, again, getting students to, to predict, um, to reflect, and to reason on their answers. So an army bus holds 36, 36 soldiers. Um, Basically, if 1,128 soldiers have been bused to their training site, how many buses are needed? So it's a, it's a word problem, but in order to solve that, basically students just have to divide 1,128 by the 36. But the issues around come up with, um, in that large study in the US, they found that 29% of students answered 31 remainder 12. So um, they, had, you know, they hadn't actually stopped and said, okay, what? 31 remainder 12, is, can, I, can I bring that back into the context of the question um, and reflect, does that answer make sense? And only 23% of students answered 32. Uh, another kind of issue that I just wanted to touch on today is the importance of language when teaching maths and how, how kind of imprecise language can often lead to, to misconceptions and errors. So I really like this quote by Durkin in 1991, mathematics education begins and proceeds in language. It advances and stumbles because of language. So I've, I'm, a, I'm sure we've all come across the kind of various jokes or in, of say, um, what, what the literal interpretations of, of what a student might have done here, expand and the student has just expanded out the brackets further and further every time. Um, but it, like, it is a serious issue. And, um, there's a that paper that I mentioned by by Ashlock earlier. He noted again a common mistake might be for students if, if this is a right angle, therefore this is is this a left angle? Um, why has that why has that happened? And if you look at, at textbooks that introduce right angle, um, the triangles are nearly the whole time they're always they're always like this. So students, you know, they're taking a literal interpretation. Okay, that has to be a right angle. Then so what's the difference? So just, I know it's a very 
it's, it's a literal interpretation, but we can't blame students if we're, if we're shown the exact same examples every time of what a right angle is. Other examples of imprecise language, you know, and we're all guilty, I'm guilty myself of, of, of saying do the, do the equation rather than maybe solve the equation, cross multiply. So these are all the shortcuts, cross multiply, cancel out both sides. These might work for the very specific thing I'm teaching, but um, again, they're shortcuts which students don't fully understand what they're doing when they cross multiply. So, you know, when we're cross multiplying, what are we actually doing? We're, it's not some magic trick that works. We're multiplying both sides um, by the lowest common denominator. Um, you know, a, a number doesn't magically move across the equal sign. Uh, we're, we're isolating the number um, and we're, we're doing the, the inverse or the opposite of, of both sides. So we're subtracting one from both sides. We're dividing three from both sides. We're adding 10 to both sides. So there are just some examples of imprecise language. And I came across a really nice um, kind of chart for when teaching algebra um, by Star et al where they had examples of imprecise language and more precise language. So instead of saying take out the x, we're factoring x from, from, the, from the expression. We're dividing both sides of the equation by x. Um, instead of saying moving the 5 over, as we noted already, you're subtracting 5 from both sides. Instead of saying a is for apples, a, a, a isn't an apple. A doesn't represent an apple. It represents the number of apples. It re represents the cost of apples. It represents the weight of apples but it doesn't represent an apple. Um, so just, you know, I, there at the end, the numbers cancel out. The numbers don't cancel out. They, they add to zero, they divide to one. So I suppose just to, I know we're all guilty of it, just, but just be very careful of the language you use when you're teaching and just try to be as precise as, as you can because students can interpret things differently and just that again leads to errors um, that they might make. Um, just one or two, uh, more, more things in terms of, uh, I'd often come across misconceptions around definitions. So um, just, uh, again, just if you have a quick think, can anyone name the following shape? And if you just wanna pop it into the chat function. Excellent, Laura. Yeah, it's definitely, it's a polygon. Well done. Um, can, I, can we be more, so can we be more specific? If, if I give you the, the next shape, this is a polygon as well. Well, what type of polygon is it? Uh, excellent, Laura. It's definitely, the, the first one is an irregular polygon. Again, can we even get more specific? So the second shape, if I ask anyone to name the second shape, I'm sure the vast majority of people here would say, that that's a hexagon. It's a regular hexagon. It's a six-sided polygon. Um, and that's, that's exactly what the first shape is in a regular hexagon. It's a six-sided polygon. So um, thanks for, for that, Laura. I think you were, you were getting to it. Um, so it's just, again, the misconceptions around what is a hexagon. A hexagon doesn't have to be a perfect regular hexagon every time. You know, you can't have an irregular hexagon. Um, so it's just an interesting, an interesting task there. There, there's, um, there's a, a resource I saw on Twitter during the week. I, I knew I was doing this webinar and just something popped up on, on Twitter about um, this. Th there was a really nice video where it highlighted the importance of embracing mistakes and the importance of not knowing. And the, the CEA, which stood for, stands for the Curriculum, Assessment, Curriculum Examinations and Assessment in Northern Ireland, um, they produce a series of videos. So I, again, I've given the link here, but they're just, again, promoting the culture of not knowing in maths and promoting the culture of not being afraid to make a mistake. Um, so there's a nice video there that you might use with your students and, and it, might, um, it might be handy. And just uh, before I finish, I just want to show you a short clip um, in terms of that kind of notion of learning from mistakes uh, and not being afraid to to make a mistake and embracing that culture and promoting that culture in your classroom. So I'm just going to show, show this video for a couple of moments.
Hi, my name is Leah Alcala. I teach eighth grade math, and this is my warm up routine that I do with my students almost every day. I call it my favorite no. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, you guys. Your warm up is on the board. I'm going to hand out your index cards. I put a warm up problem on the board, hand out index cards to all the kids, have them write their answer, I collect it, and then I sort it. And I say, yes, no, yes, no. And I look for my favorite wrong answer, or my favorite no, and we analyze that. Four minutes to work on it. Everyone makes mistakes. We're going to see your mistakes. You're going to see my mistakes. But a mistake is your opportunity to share with me how much you understand. And if I don't know that you don't know something, I need to teach you before the test. The test is too late. And this is a great spot for me to teach you. Make sure your name is on your card. Put your pencil in your pencil slot and pass your cards to the center. I started my warm-up routine to replace clickers that a lot of classes are buying. So that was a clicker for each student. You ask a question, they lock in an answer. And then you look at your computer screen and you know what percentage of your students understand the problem. Well, we didn't have the money for that, so instead... Okay, here we go. I thought, well, what if I gave everyone index cards, collected them real quick with their answers already written on it, and then I can just sort them as quick as possible and find out what percentage of my kids know the answer. No. Yes. Costs 40 cents instead of $15,000. Yes, so we have quite a few yeses and some very interesting no's. One, two, three, four. I then took that a step further, something I couldn't do with clickers. Look at the ones who are getting it wrong. How far are they from getting it right and showing that work to the other kids? Okay, my favorite no. Someone wrote this. I say it's my favorite no because I want the kids to first of all recognize what they're about to see is wrong. And I want them to recognize that there's something good in the problem. Like there's a mistake, but it's my favorite no because it showed some good math. So that's the wrong answer. But they did some things that I love. What in that problem am I happy to see? We always talk about what's right first so that if it's any student's work, they are like, oh, I did do that right. There's a mistake, but the mistake didn't ruin the whole thing. What do I like about this problem? Gavin. Well, um, they distributed both um, with the 4x and the negative 2. Very nice. And what Today's lesson was on factoring, so I needed to make sure they understood how to distribute. They distributed, and what, what lets you know that they distributed? David? Uh, how there are no more parentheses. There are no more parentheses, and they didn't just drop the parentheses. So they're drop. asked to distribute a term with a variable. They're asked to distribute twice. They're asked to distribute a term with a negative sign, which is often a very common mistake that kids make. And my students do not. like. I have three years of CST data now to show that one mistake my students do not make is distributing a negative, which is amazing because they used to all the time. Distributing negative 2 to negative 6 is positive 12. And that was one mistake I was absolutely looking for and I did not see, which made me very happy. Not until the very end, as we've gone over different sections of the problem that are right, that I will then ask, okay, now what is incorrect. What does this person not understand? Where is the mistake? If I get a third of my class raising their hand ready to tell me the mistake, that it's pretty high engagement at that point. Mia? Um, like 4x times 2x mm -hmm. equals um, 8x squared. Very nice. This 4x times 2x multiplies to 8x squared. Can someone convince me of that? How do we know that 4x times 2x is 8x squared? My low-level students are very engaged. They feel like they're not getting... Okay, so um, again, I just really like that video clip. It's a really nice 
it shows in action how a teacher using you know minimal resources um, can can really target a mistake and um, there there's you know if you get a chance to watch that video again she does it really really well um, and there's some you know minor things like not writing writing out not using the student's card so their handwriting can, might be identified by other students writing it out herself um, really focusing on the positives even when she focuses on the mistake at the end uh, you know the student that like nobody knows who's made that mistake so even this, the people who have their hand up that might be the student who's already made that mistake so i just think it's a really nice video to show uh, how how we might be able to target mistakes in our own teaching so just to, to conclude today um it's not possible to interpret it every er every error there are always some unusual errors that could be described as slips or, or, or short mistakes. But if, if what we did today was we, you know, we just didn't look at one example, we, we normally took three examples of students work and we were able to then see a pattern and, and diagnose that. Um, and many, many errors occur through, through the short term or shortcut explanations of conceptual ideas like, um, you know, uh, multiplication makes numbers bigger, subtraction makes numbers smaller. Uh, you know, when you multiply a number by 10, you just add a zero to the end. You know, a lot, an awful lot of misconceptions occur through those kind of shortcut explanations. And, and in order to address those, targeted instruction is required. So I really hope you found that webinar useful. I, I hope that uh, you took away a couple of things from it that you can use in your own teaching. And um, I, I'll send the slides on to Fergus um, so that she so that she have access to them thanks a million to everyone for getting involved um i know it's it's hard uh you know when when you're online in an online setting and you, and you don't know anyone but um i really appreciate it all of those who kind of contributed and gave the answers uh in the chat function and also through through discussion itself so um i hope you enjoyed it and i hope you got something from it and enjoy the rest of maths week and and the long weekend as well uh, we have time for some questions if anyone if anyone has them as well, Fergus. Yeah, and um, actually stop sharing. Mark, thanks a million. That was great. I'm not a maths teacher, but I really enjoyed that and learned lots of things. So I hope people enjoyed it. And yeah, I'd encourage you now to unmute and give a comment or a question or a suggestion or something you've seen or you do or yeah, just unmute and ask. We we still have five minutes so. Um, Mark, I just see that Felix has written in earlier, I find building up intuition a very good approach, as you say, using estimation, for example. Do you like that idea? Yeah, I just, I'm just reading that now. Um, it's a little bit further back, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so letting the misconceptions occur, yeah. And that, that was kind of one of the two strategies. So the first strategy was let them occur and then deal with them. or. or yeah, Felix, I, I, I tend to agree with you. If you go through all the possible misconceptions that might possibly occur at the start, then, you know, it might be confusing. So um, better to let them happen and then deal with, with them. Um, so uh, that's a really, that's a really good comment. Excuse Anyone me, else uh, want to unmute and ask something or make a comment? Um, So I'll um, at the end at the end of the slides, Fergus. I'll include um, I'll include a, a number of different references uh, for for some of them readings. As I said, that Ashlock paper is really good. Um, it has some lovely examples of, of different errors that occur and how you might deal with them. And um, I, I'll ensure to include those. And again, if if you ever do want to reach out and if you need any resources um, or if you've come across something. Um, please feel free to, to give me an email. My email address is on the very first slide um, and I'd love to, love to hear from you. Um, um, thanks a million, Mark. Um, I think that comes to the end. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, quite a few of you have seen your names come up all week. And so it was great to get support and it's tough taking an hour out to tune in something, but I uh, hope you found them beneficial and useful. So just once again, thanks very much, Mark. You're always calm and explain everything really clearly. You use plain English and plain maths and plain numeracy. So thanks, Fergus. 
yeah thanks. thanks for all the, the messages there in the in the comments really appreciate it yeah okay everyone all the best bye bye thanks enjoy for... the weekend cheers mark thanks <laughs>